From Berkeley, California, we bring you Mad Chai, a mad science talk show hosted by Berkeley's resident mad scientist, Dr. Vivian Ming. She's dedicated her life to building mind-reading technologies, running experiments on her kids, helping Silicon Valley's horniest get laid, and more, all propelled by the belief that mad science can and will solve everything. And now, we introduce the brilliant, the bold, the audacious, the endearingly offensive, Dr. Vivian Ming. I'm Vivian Ming. This cup is empty because haven't you noticed that I've been wearing the same shirt all week long? Uh, I, I drank all of my chai. Uh, doesn't change the fact that this is mad chai. And we're going to talk, I am told, about The Simpsons. But I feel it needs a preamble. Uh, and this preamble is not at all about The Simpsons or about the topic we're about to cover. But it is about... Um, uh, what do you call it? What do you call it when there's something you love and it's not good? You know it's not good, but guilty you love it anyway. A guilty pleasure. A guilty pleasure. Uh, so, oh, I always love getting together with my friends and watching Melrose Place, and they're all so catty. I, we love getting together and watching Tiger King, all those horrible people. I've never watched it. I don't watch, uh reality TV. But I get that's what a lot of people tell themselves when they watch this thing. So science fiction has its guilty pleasure crowd as well. And these people watch trauma films. And it's not just a trauma. Uh, it, things like the Toxic Avengers and um, Reanimator. I think I saw a poll recently said the main character in Reanimator was one of the greatest characters in science fiction history. It tells you how deeply invested so many genre fans, as we call ourselves sometimes, to be snooty and to uh, show our own lack of confidence in our life choices. Uh, science fiction and fantasy fans uh, is so many people love these guilty pleasures, these trashy B-movies. Uh, and I will freely admit, I have never gotten that at all. Uh, I, I think maybe the one trashy B movie that has ever really resonated with me is a pretty big one, uh, which is uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. But boy, there was something much deeper going on here than just a trashy, dumb movie made on a $100 budget. Uh, but you see these other movies. And for whatever reason, it has just never interested me. I have never been willing for me to be the person that puts in the effort to create in my head the good version of this thing that I would have liked. And I've never been interested in making fun of the bad version. If it's bad, it's bad. And why do I need to make fun of someone? Uh, so I don't watch Plan 9 from Outer Space. I've never watched The Toxic Adventure. I have no interest in this schlocky stuff. And unfortunately, that covers a lot of sci-fi shows. And if I name some of them, I will get death threats. So I'm not going to. But I bet you know what kinds of shows I'm talking about. Some of which were fairly popular and have huge followings nowadays. Um, they weren't good. And you know they weren't good. You know that you were the one doing all of the work to create a show in your head which was good, uh, when instead you could have been watching The Simpsons. So, what is our topic specifically about The Simpsons? I've been working for you for about a year now, and I would say about 50% of our meetings, there is some interjection by you that starts with, well, there was this one episode of The Simpsons, and I've never watched The Simpsons, Simpsons before in my entire life. So what are three So here is the, the dirty secret behind that then. Uh, the Simpsons has been one of the longest running shows of all time. Uh, uh, I think it's one, if not the longest running episodic primetime show in America. But Coronation Street, Doctor Who, uh, the British beat that easily by time. By actual episodes, of course, there's only in fact been 12 episodes of Doctor Who. It's a dirty secret uh, across the 70 six years of its existence. Um, 
but uh, I, it may interest you to know I've only ever actually referenced one single episode of The Simpsons across all of the thousands of episodes I could have been referencing. Uh, that's not true. Uh, so the truth is, what I am referencing is one slice in time. Uh, the early seasons of The Simpsons were something special because its competition was the Cosby Show. And we can all poke fun at uh, Bill Cosby now, if you want to call it poking fun. Um, but at the time, it really was like a phenomenon um, that this idea of getting together with this family that frankly didn't look like much of the rest of America and yet behaved like much of the rest of America, except Apparently, every expanded member of the family was a poet laureate or a famous jazz musician. That is a weird aside of the Cosby show. Um, but you had this perfect 80s setting. And then uh, you had this episode. And yeah, there were the shorts on... Uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the sketch comedy show that The Simpsons started on. It was shorts... Ah, I'm blanking. I can't produce it. So sorry to the people that worked on the show, most of whom are now cast members on The Simpsons, but the actual show was named after this British actress and I'm not producing her name. Whatever, that's where it started. I saw episodes of it back then, um, but it was that first episode where they get Stanley's little helper. Uh, and, you know, this idea of a show where everyone is a deplorable, if you will, um, yet not in the way, uh, that we would actually criticize. They're deplorables because all Americans are on some level and they were so American. And the one gift, you know, Homer blows all of the money, uh, on Christmas gifts at the racetrack and Bart gets half of a tattoo at the mall what mall allows little kids to get tattoos, but it feels like America. And again, it's the eighties. So this was risk A. Uh, and Marge has to spend all of her Christmas money getting the tattoo removed and they got nothing left. So in the end, they find this dog, which at first they want to get rid of. And Homer thinks he has to go home and admit that he blew the money and they don't have any Christmas. And then Santa's little helper runs in and it, you know, the, the show is redeemed. Uh, so that was my introduction. Cosby Show, it's morning in America, good uh, Republican uh, uh, setting of the early 80s, and then this thing comes along, and it is so different. I mean, there is no South Park. There is no Rick and Morty. There is none of the changes in culture that have happened. Um, uh, and then this thing comes along, and it felt like they were making a show that was all the more real than all of the real shows going on around it, even though it was animated. Having said all of that, first few seasons uh, are better than what was going on around it, but it was this period that I think of like the middle period, except it's not the middle period anymore. Now it is like indistinguishable from first few seasons. But there is this period of like the fourth, fifth, sixth season, roughly speaking. So no more than that, uh, uh, Conan O'Brien was a writer on the show. And like, you can, you can hear his voice in some of the characters, but the writers were amazing. And you have these episodes uh, whose names I'm not gonna produce off the top of my head, but if you know The Simpsons, you will know it when I say it. One of the greatest pieces of American episodic television ever is the episode in which um, Maggie finds Mr. Burns' teddy bear. Uh, it is superlative. If I were to run a master class on writing television comedy and why the hell would I? Because I've never written anything for television or comedic or anything at all. But if I were to pretend, if I were to play the character of someone writing a masterclass on television comedy, that would be my opening lesson. Watch this episode. Watch the scene 
where Mr. Burns and Mr. Smithers try to repeatedly sneak in to the Simpsons household. Something which, of course, they don't need to do because Mr. Burns is incredibly powerful and Homer works for him and he could get this bear back if he wanted to. But for whatever reason, they go through this absurd exercise of trying to sneak in. And in fact, at one point, uh, they get these like suction cups on their knees and their elbows and they, they climb along the ceiling of the house. They get all the way into the kitchen when in the middle of the night, Homer comes wandering in and for no other reason than it's Homer Simpson pulls out a big stack of American cheese slices and simply says, mmm, a uh, 300 slices of American cheese, and then just begins to unwrap and eat them one by one, while the two of them, unbeknownst to him, are hovering above him uh, on the ceiling. And then it cuts immediately the next morning. Marge walks in, and Homer says, and you see a scene of him just like literally struggling to put one last slice in his mouth as he says, oh, one last slice. And Marge walks in and he says, Homer, have you been up all night eating American cheese? To which Homer responds, I think I'm blind. And then uh, Mr. Burns and Mr. Smithers fall off the ceiling, pop up and say, good day to you. And then march right out the door. It is ridiculous, but the timing, the, the specific little elements of everything that happened, no single part of that is funny. And yet, put together, it was this period of time where this was the greatest show of all time. Uh, and, um, and that episode is one of the great examples of that. It plays on Citizen Kane. It plays on post-apocalyptic, uh, far future, uh, I, even just the setting where these uh, there is an opening scene, but it eventually... Uh, on, on, you know, there's this Rosebud X scene. I don't think I'm giving anything away to anyone. If you had wanted to see it, you've had a good 30 years to see it at this point. Um, where Mr. Burns has this teddy bear, uh, but unlike uh, in Citizen Kane, when they uh, offer to send him off to a fancy school, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't want to leave his Rosebud his sled behind. He doesn't want to go. Mr. Burns is out the door in a shot, just leaves the, the teddy bear behind. Uh, and then it's discovered. So how do you cut? This is one of the masterful things about The Simpsons. Um, how do you cut from a tribute to Citizen Kane that happens decades and decades before this, the next scene? How do you cut to the discovery of a teddy bear? Well, it gets lost in the, the snow, so it gets covered up with snow, and then it's discovered in a block of ice by a bunch of seemingly Arctic explorers, except all of this is somehow happening in Springfield state of num num num. Uh, and so they carve out this block along with a bunch of other blocks of ice, pull it in to uh, Apu's, uh, you know, 7-Eleven S store, I know Apu is a character non grata anymore, but nonetheless, uh, he was part of what made the show special as well. Dealing with the fact that it is a deeply offensive character that was intentionally modeled on a stereotype of a model of uh, Indian is doesn't take away from the fact that so many people grew up conflicted with its presentation. But nonetheless, these blocks of ice come in uh, to the quickie stop and they're using them as ice to for people to buy ice at the store. Uh, like, what? So everything's out of time. Everything's out of place. There's nothing about space or time that works out there. And yet, it just amazingly... And when the guy says to Apu, you've got to think of some... Uh, you know, we've got to get paid more for this ice. I lost three men on this expedition. Apu simply says, tell me a better way to get ice, uh, which is no kind of answer at all. Uh, and yet it, it got us from the opening scene to the important next scene, which is that Homer buys uh, this bag of ice that has this ratty old 
80 year old teddy bear in it and uh, Maggie falls in love with it. And that launches the whole rest of the show. And all of that takes like 120 seconds. And I don't know that I could write that ever, but it is amazing. All of it was amazing. Not because uh, even within the genre of what we might call the Matt Groening uh, experience, Futurama has so much more heart. Uh, uh, you know, I think about if someone told me that there was a new Futurama, one single episode out there, and I have to pay $20 to see it, I would pay that money. I think there are still Simpsons episodes going on, and yet I don't bother watching them. Uh, but that period in time, that was something so new and so different. And there were periods where it got bad, and then, but they had, then they earned the chance to experiment. So you had them getting very meta and playing with their, like the episode, worst episode ever episode where they're just poking fun at their own mythology and the own ridiculousness of the whole thing. Um, and of course, for someone like me, uh, episodes uh, like the one where Lisa gets her future uh, told at the carnival um, and it sucks. Uh, and yet we get to explore the themes of The Simpsons, which is uh, the purpose of family is to love and support one another, uh, even if you are all deeply, deeply imperfect. Um, and that is where the heart, even though it doesn't have that same substance that Futurama has, uh, that simple little heart really made the show something special. Can't comment, honestly, on the last 10 years, 15 years of The Simpsons, but the early uh, series, maybe even the first half of it, was genuinely... Uh, and arguably one of the best shows ever made. Uh, the people that worked on it should be proud. Who cares what else you did with your life? That alone is a testament to something special. Uh, I don't know why Matt Groening gets uh, any kudos. I have no idea even what degree he was involved in the show. It is the writing and the acting that made it something so special. And so... Part of it is it's a little bit like the Beatles, like, you know, they put out two albums every year for 10 years. There's a lot of Beatles songs. Uh, inevitably, they're going to hit on a few of them. Their hit rate is really high. The Simpsons has been around for a long time. They put out a lot of episodes in a way that modern shows do not anymore. There could be some stinkers and still be something amazing. But I'm talking about a, a run of time where a show was like nothing else ever before and guaranteed that you would laugh out loud on every episode. And yes, I know I live in a world where sometime around that same moment in time, my uncle once said to me, uh, you know, keep shows like that. Uh, I'll take Andrew Dice Clay. All right, we have different definitions of what is funny. Uh, and that's fine. I can be right. You can be wrong. That is a world that I can be comfortable with. But... This was funny uh, and this was special and it got all the more special by the fact that it got, uh, you know, George Bush worked up and and people didn't understand that it was it was uh, a much needed criticism of so many of the things we took for granted. I think the one reason why I don't give the Apu character a pass on The Simpsons but I try to recognize what they were trying to do with it is everything touched by the Simpsons was intentionally tarnished. That was their thing was we are all flawed. Uh, Australians are all beer swilling Mad Max characters and uh, Brits are all effete snobs and Americans are all fat bastards. I loved we didn't do it. Hey, everybody. Hi, Dr. Uh, then they have to get off mute. Screw it. <laughs> Forget it. It was one of the great gags of all time that Dr. Nick Riviera would walk into every scene, a big character. Surely no other show in history has as many uh, bit characters that are as much a part of the public consciousness as The Simpsons. So you have a character like Lionel Hutz, or Dr. Nick, or any of them. And anytime Dr. Nick would walk in, 
uh, he would say, if you never watched the show, and again, you're a bad person. Um, and he'd walk in and he'd say, hi, everybody. And his weird, what part of Eastern Europe is that supposed to be accent? And everyone, no matter what, would spontaneously say, hi, Dr. Nick. Uh, and it just became like this part of my life to get this little injection of the failure of a human that Lionel Hutz is. Or um, the, I, I loved a, another great episode is the one where Homer decides he wants to intentionally go on disability by becoming morbidly obese. And so he goes to his doctor who himself is uh, intentionally a, um, uh, 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 not a tribute to, uh, a caricature of, uh, from the Cosby show. Um, but he goes to him and he says his plan, I, I want to become morbidly obese so that I can go on a disability and never have to work. I can just work from home and never have to go in again. And uh, his doctor, Dr. Hibbert says, oh my God, that is the worst thing I've ever had heard. How could you possibly want to do this to yourself? I will have nothing to do with it. Here is a referral to someone that will. Uh, and it's Dr. Nick. And the reason all of that layup is just one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life is when Dr. Nick explains in pseudo-medical fashion uh, how the test, the test to know whether Homer should eat something or not. And he gives them this list, this like, if it does this, then, uh, you know, don't eat it. If it does this, then do eat it. And the one that I loved is the bag test. So you hold up the bag. And if it's so greasy, you can actually see the food inside through the paper bag, then you know you should eat it. And at one point, Homer gets like this uh, thing of fried chicken or something like that. And he says, but Dr. Nick, should I eat this fried chicken? <laughs> And he takes it from him and he rubs it on the wall and you can see through to the exam room all the way through the wall. And he said, yes, <laughs> you know, this is the perfect thing for your diet. And it just, it was so absurd, but for the fact that that is a caricature of America and, and one I always felt like we needed not because we're bad people, but because we could be better. Isn't that the whole point? So why do I reference The Simpsons so much? Because they specifically looked at the absurdity of what it is to be an American amongst many other things. And a lot of our work here at Sokos Labs is exploring the very real absurdity of what it is just to be alive. And so it turns out there's a lot of good moral lessons and quite frankly, I have zero interest in name dropping Kierkegaard or Kant or anyone else. So I go with The Simpsons instead. And that is why Kat is inflicted with these references that she knows nothing about that and the fact that I love to rub it into her face that she is a horrible, horrible person for one, having a cat and two, knowing nothing about The Simpsons. <laughs> So I think I'm all done for today. Uh, not because I don't have more to say about The Simpsons, but because uh, my diabetic son is actually waving frantically out of the corner of my eye. And this might be one of those moments where I'm supposed to be a good mom and not me. So I'm gonna go work on that. Thank you all so much for tuning in for another Mad Chai. And we're gonna have a whole bunch more of these over the next several weeks. And if you really like them, we'll just stop because I know from Fox, the network, that's what you should do with really good shows. But if you hate them, uh, I promise we will not only record as many as we can, we will actually mass mail them to everyone. Uh, and I'll see if I can get congressional approval of this being part of school curriculum. Uh, so that along with teaching our kids how to be transgender Muslims, uh, we will also show this every single day because I understand that to be something of a concern of some of yours. Let's just get the conspiracy out there right now. Bye. Mad Chai is produced by Sokos Labs. Our theme music is by Tim Beek. 
to submit your questions and ideas for our next episode. Follow us on Twitter, at Circus Labs, and use the hashtag MadChai in your reply.